Well, Boulder Mountain, we're in a series, we started it last week, called Jesus Changes Everything. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that to be true in your own life. Jesus changes everything. We began the series last week, we looked at the character of Thomas. Thomas was a skeptic, and Jesus changed everything in Thomas's life. Today, we'll look at another character in the weeks to come. We'll look at other characters centered around the Easter story, the, the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection, the characters in that story. Today, we're looking at, he has an out. He has an out. You all have to stay here, but he has an out. Love hearing the sound of crying babies. I'm so grateful for that. Today, we're looking at religious leaders. A religious leader. As we look at the text today is the book of Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 16. 9 through 14, my apologies. Luke 18, 9 through 14. That'll be our, our text we'll look at. We'll also look at Matthew 26, 1 to 3. If you have a Bible, great, you can follow along. We have some in the room or you can pull it up on your device if you have a phone or a screen of some kind. Or you can just simply listen to the Word of God. Here at Boulder Mountain, we're a Bible church, so the decisions that we make come from, come from God's Word. <clears throat> Who's the villain in the Easter story? Who's the villain throughout the Gospels? If you're a superhero fan, right, a good superhero movie has heroes right, and villains. I tend to be more of a Batman fan myself, right? In every movie, Batman's got a villain that he's fighting up against. I don't know who your favorite hero is other than Jesus. That's the right answer because you're in church. But other heroes that you might have. But who's the villain of the Gospels? Now, the first answer that might come to your head is Satan. Satan's always out to try to steal, kill, and destroy, right? And, and yes, but more ink in the Gospels is given to the religious leader, to the religious leader. And so we're going to look at the place and the characters of the religious leaders today. Who are the religious leaders? They go back to hundreds of years before when God set up the religious system and the structure. You had Levi, son of, of Jacob, as the first priest in the tribe of Levi, all the priests would come from the tribe of Levi. You had Aaron, Moses' brother, and you see the beginning of this early on in the Old Testament. You also have some opposing parties, groups that you may be familiar with. You had Sadducees and you had Pharisees. Now, we, we read the text and we think they're all in the same group and they're all in agreement with each other. They actually were in opposition with each other. They were opposing parties. They were very, very different. Yes, Jewish religious leaders, but they had, had different belief systems. The Sadducees, they did not believe in angels. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in the resurrection. They were an elite group a wealthy group, and their job was to keep the peace between the Jews and the Romans. And their greatest fear was an insurrection, right? The greatest fear was that there would be a threat to that peace between the Jews and the Romans. And so because they didn't believe in those things, they were so very sad, you see. You knew that was coming. You got to give me that one. Then you had another group Right? The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They were progressive in most matters, conservative when it came to the law. Then you had the Pharisees who were conservative all around. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. Pharisees believed in angels. Pharisees believed in the miracle, in the miraculous. And they believed in the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the Old Testament law. So you have Pharisees and you have Sadducees in opposition with each other, okay? They're, they're not all on the same page here. That's important to know. Then you have, you have scribes. Scribes' job, very meticulous job. Their responsibility was to, to write the manuscripts and to produce and to copy the manuscripts as they, as they were produced. So that was their job. Jesus, when he was 12, was left at the temple, 
I think I've shared this story with you. Seven kids in my home. I was left at the rest area on my way on vacation. The parents said, we'll get them on the way back. So I can relate to Jesus on that. But it was three days Jesus was left at the temple. All right? I, I lost my mind when I couldn't find my daughter for five minutes at an expo center. I thought, the, you know, I was crazy. Three days, Mary and Joseph were like, where's Jesus at? So they go, they go looking for him. Jesus is found in the temple, if you remember the story. In Luke chapter 2, he's found in the temple, and he is having conversation with the scribes. He's actually teaching the scribes at 12 years of age. And what is said about him is he spoke as he had authority. Right? So you have Sadducees, you have Pharisees, you have scribes, you have priests. And at the time of Jesus, you had Caiaphas, his father-in-law, Annas, Annas and Caiaphas. These are the, all the religious leaders that they all played a role in the crucifixion of Jesus. There were trials, and we would refer to them as, as mock trials because they weren't, they weren't fair trials. We'll look more at that next week. But they all do the, the dirty work in leading Jesus to the cross. Luke chapter 18, verse, verse 9. This will give us some context for the religious leader. Verse 9. He also told this parable. A parable is a heavenly truth, heavenly principles, right? For, for earthly relevance. He also told this parable to some who were trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Why is Jesus telling this parable? Because there were those there who thought they were right with God because of their actions, because of their works, because of what they did, because of their behavior. So Jesus tells the story to those who trusted in themselves. This is the group of people who say, I'm okay, everybody else is not okay. There are those there who need help, but it's not me. I'm okay, everybody else is not okay. So Jesus tells a parable. The second characteristic, not only did they find that righteousness in their works, they had contempt on everyone else. So they lived their life, this is a, they lived their life looking down, treating others with contempt. They lived their life with an air of superiority. I am I'm better than you. I make better choices than you. My behavior is more acceptable and more pleasing to God. So that's why Jesus is telling this story. Jesus is aware in his day, and we're aware that in our day, there are individuals who feel like I'm okay. I'm good. My good outweighs my bad. And there are those in our day who look down on others. Who, who view themselves as one step higher than, than everybody else, who, who have an air of superiority about them. Jesus continues, verse 10, two men went up to, into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, religious leader, and one a tax collector. Now, a tax collector, they would have heard that. Everybody hated tax collectors. Not much different than our day. Sorry. We're, we're about that time of the year, right? It's pushing April. So I was just kidding on that, if there are any IRS agents in the room. The tax collectors were hated. They were despised. They were not liked. They were viewed as traitors. Right? Jewish tax collectors especially, they would, they would take the percentage that Rome was charging the Jewish people, and then they would add on their own percent, and they, would, they were viewed as thieves. And, right? and so they would... They hear that, and they did not like tax collectors. So the two men go, one's a Pharisee, religious leader, and the other's a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, the text doesn't say this, but we ask ourselves the questions. Anytime you come to the text, you ask yourself questions. Observe the text. Why is he standing alone? The text doesn't tell us. Right? Is it because he's up front? He's all by himself, up front. Why would he be alone so everybody could see him? The Pharisee, seen by himself, prayed this, and I think he's praying out loud. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And I view him kind of pointing at the tax collector. 
What's he even doing here? Who invited him? Does he know that this is not a place for him? God, thank you that I'm not like those people. God, thank you that I'm not like that guy. Have any of us ever said that or thought that? God, thank you that I'm not as bad as as him. This is his prayer. Listen, God, this is in his prayer. He's listing his good works. I fast twice a week. That wasn't even the law to fast twice a week. That was bonus. He's like going above and beyond. It's like I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of all that I get. If they found a dime on the sidewalk, they're given a penny in the offering, right? Everything they got, they were, they were giving it. I give, but the tax collector standing far off, far off. They weren't standing next to each other. The Pharisee would not stand next to a tax collector. Standing afar off. There was distance that separated him. Why? Because he was superior in his behavior and his, in his attitude. Standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. I, I, I kind of view he puts his hand on his chest. As the Pharisee's head is up, this man's head is down. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, this is his prayer, seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The prayer of someone who recognizes that they are not okay and that they are in need of a Savior. Seven words. He doesn't list his behavior, doesn't list his actions. He asks God for mercy. God, give me mercy. Show me mercy. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus sums up the parable. This is a short parable. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Now, justified, just what does that word mean? It means being made right with God. Justified. Some of us are made right with God. You are right with God. Some of us are not right with God. How are we made right with God? By admitting our need for a Savior. By admitting that I am a sinner in need of great mercy. We are not made right with God by listing our works and telling God how amazing we are. That is not how we're saved. R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul with Ligonier Ministries, a number of years ago, he did a a survey and asked thousands of people the age-old question that Billy Graham would often ask, the late Billy Graham would often ask this question. Billy Graham was an evangelist in the United States for, for decades, and he would ask, if you were to die tonight, if you were to die tonight, and you stand before God, and he asks you the question, why should I let you into heaven? What would be your response? And in this survey of thousands and thousands of people, over 90% answered the question with, because I'm a good person. It was a works-based answer was the answer to that question. Because I, and they list that because I'm a good person, because I'm a good parent, because I haven't been to prison, because I haven't done drugs. It was a list of works and behaviors and answer, 90% of people answered that question. And my friends, that is not how we're saved. That is not how we're justified. That is not how we're made right with God because we're a good person. Paul tells us our good works are like rags, dirty, filthy rags. They do, they do nothing when it comes to our need for salvation. Two of them. One of them is made right with God. And the other one, it was for show. Now, the reality is they're both in need of a Savior. Only one of them admitted it. Only one of them recognized it. They're both sinners. They're both extortioners. They're both unjust. They're both adulterers, as Jesus describes them. Or they, they both are. Only one of them recognized it. And only one of them goes home to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Proverbs 16.8 says it this way, pride goeth before the fall, right? And what what was the point? Who's listening to this? Who's listening to this story? Religious leaders are listening to the story that Jesus is telling Religion says that if you do this, then you will be good and you will earn your own righteousness. 
And you end up despising others who you regard to be less righteous themselves. Have you ever thought about, I can't believe that they would behave that way. I can't, I'm so glad I, I'm not like those people. That's a very dangerous place to be. Why do we have a ministry for those people? Why do we need this group for those people? Listen, church, I'll be as honest as I can be with you today. I am those people. Uh, yeah, you're like, you're a pastor, so aren't you more on the religious leader? Yes, but I am in need of a Savior because I am a sinner as I stand here before you today. And I say to God on a daily basis, God, have mercy on me, for I'm a great sinner. I need grace. And we all stand shoulder to shoulder together, recognizing our need for mercy and for grace. Some of us have this idea that following Jesus is just a whole list of rules and laws that we're trying to follow. I mean, the religious leaders of the day, they just did what they were taught. Over 600 rules and laws they were adhering to on a regular basis. And somewhere along the line, they elevated these rules and laws to be more important than the people. Young parents in the room, if you've ever had children, you don't have children to make sure there's somebody to play with the toys. You don't have children to serve the toys, right? When you have small children, track with me here, you have a baby, you have small children, you end up buying them toys. The toys are for the children. God does not have people so the people can obey his rules and laws. It's the other way around. His boundaries that he gives for us are for our benefit. They're for our good. And some of us got, got it twisted up somewhere along our, our life, either the religion, the, the institution that we were raised in, or what we were taught is you behave well and you follow all these rules and laws, then you'll be good and then God will love you. That was what I grew up in. All of us probably have a story of what we heard when we were raised within the bubble, the religious bubble that we were raised in. For me, it was a fundamental Baptist school that I went to. I've shared this with some of you. Uh, if I didn't have a belt on, if I, if I didn't have a collar on, if I, my hair didn't touch my collar, which if my hair did touch my collar, that's not a problem anymore. Any one of these reasons, which all of those had to do with my parents, how they, my parents dressed me, right? Then I would be brought before the class with a, with a metal folding chair. I'd hold on to it, put my head between the, the hole between the, the back and the front, and I'd be spanked in front of the class, right, with a, with a paddle, two-inch thick paddle with holes in it that the teacher grabbed off the wall. That's what I thought was normal. I grew up thinking, oh, if I'm bad, then my, I displease my, my teacher, my principal, my coach, my parents. If I'm good, they'll love me more. That was, that was the religion I, I grew up in. Some of you may have a different story. Some of you may show me scars where the nun hits you with a ruler. I've heard that story many, many times. Right? It was behavior modification is what many of us grew up with and heard for so many times. And what Jesus comes to do, he doesn't come and add more rules and more laws. He comes and he says, there's a better way. He came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to tweak an old system. He didn't show up and say, I'm, I'm going to take this. I'm just going to tweak a little bit. He comes up and he says, there's a completely new way to live. I fulfilled the law. And then when he's asked, hey, what's the greatest commandment? This is it. This is it. He sums it all up. He doesn't have 600 for you. He doesn't have 100 for you. He doesn't have 50 for you. Here's the good news. Two, love God, love people. Any questions? And what's described by the religious leader at the beginning of this parable, he's 0 for 2. He's not loving God. He doesn't even see a need for God because he's pretty good on himself. He doesn't love others. He views them with contempt. He's 0 for 2. Love God and love people. Some of us have made this list. We view this rules, commandments as the most important thing. No, God is for you. He, he loves you. And any guidelines and boundaries he's placed in your life are for your benefit. He didn't made you, make you to serve his, his law. And I'm so sorry if you were raised thinking that, that you have to adhere to a certain list of standards. None of us will ever measure up to that. And it's exhausting. 
At the beginning of the year, my wife and I were looking at car insurance because our premiums were going way up through the roof, and so maybe some of you can relate to this. So we landed on a car insurance company that said, hey, if for 90 days we track your driving, at the end of the 90 days, if you do a really good job, then we'll give you a discount. We're like, game on, sign us up. We download the app. And it tracks four things if you're driving. It tracks your acceleration rate. Can't, can't hit that pedal too fast. It tracks your braking. Can't brake too fast. It tracks your speed and it tracks your phone usage. Those four categories. And I'm like, all right, we're, we're going to do this. Now, at the, you can open up the app and you have to confirm every ride and everything. I used to love driving. <laughs> I hate it. I'm a slave to that app every time I get in the car now. I'm a slave to it. And how people are flying by me. I'm on the 60. Have you ever tried to ride on the 60, US 60, going the speed limit? <laughs> it's extremely dangerous. <laughs> and people are honking at me and giving me gestures. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just trying to I'm following the app. I'm a slave to this app. There's no joy. It's it gives me anxiety. I, I'm, I'm worried. And if I go one mile per hour over in a 45-minute limit, it's 46. Oh, no. It's going to dock me points. And at the bottom of the app, it tells you where you're ranked in your family. <laughs> I'm really competitive. <laughs> and so early on, I'm like, I'm going to really enjoy this. I'm going to win. This is going to be great. It's 90 days. We're at like day 70. We got 20 more days left. I was in first place for like most, and then two days ago, my wife overtook me. Our daughter is way, she's not even in the running anymore. She's like out of it. And so I'll keep you updated on that and who, who gets the gold medal. This is how many of us view our relationship with God. That I have to act a certain way, I have to behave a certain way, and if I get out of bounds, I'm, I'm going to lose. At the end of the day, am I, is my good works, am I good enough? And I live, I don't know. I don't know who's winning today. I don't know who's going to win. I don't know if I'm going to get this discount. If I go 90 days and we don't get a discount, oh man, that's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> but some of us have been enslaved to a list of rules and laws. And Jesus says in Matthew 23 to religious leaders, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. This happened many times in the family on the way to church growing up. Seven kids in the van, a lot of yelling. We were late. Tears are flowing. We didn't look very nice in the van, but we'd pull into the parking spot at church. My dad would snap his fingers, get it together, right? Get it together. Can't walk into church acting like, the whole morning was a disaster and a train wreck, but it was. You have to put on a really good image. And I want Boulder Mountain to be a place where we can say it's not good. It was a really rough morning. And for those of us who are late coming into church, there was a reason we were late. I want to hear that reason. I, like, I want to sit with you. I, there's something going on in your life. This is a safe place to say not everything is good in my life right now. There's only a couple times Jesus is upset that we're aware of in Scripture, that was recorded. One gets most of the attention is when he gets angry at the, those who are exchanging money at the temple. He gets upset about that because my house should be called a house of prayer, not a house of a profit and money exchanging. And the other time is, is in Mark chapter 3. And a, a man is brought before them and he heals a man who he has got a, a crippled hand, a deformed hand. And Jesus has the man stand up and he asks the religious leaders, is the Sabbath, because it was the Sabbath, they weren't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath, so much so that if somebody needed medical attention, they would not give them medical attention. And Jesus asks the question, is the Sabbath for man or is man for the Sabbath, right? Who's serving what and what is serving who? God gave us the Sabbath for our benefit and our enjoyment. And over the centuries, man began to serve the Sabbath and began to be enslaved to this app that they couldn't, they couldn't do anything on. That was never the intention. It was never God's intention. And so the man stands up and he asks the question, 
about the Sabbath. You're supposed to give life on the Sabbath? Or you're supposed to kill on the Sabbath? Because if you don't heal somebody who needs help, you're, you're letting them die, right? And they were all silent. Not one of them answered the questions. This is early verses of Mark chapter 3. And it says that Jesus was indignant. He was, he was angry. Why is he angry? Because people are viewing his rules and his laws as more important than people. That grieves, us. that grieves him. And for some of us, we were in that bubble. And when you're in the bubble, you don't really recognize it. You get out of the bubble, like, oh my word, that was unhealthy. Because at the end of the day, religion hurts people. Religion, when it's used as a, as a weapon, it, and the, the tools are, are guilt, and it's shame, it's manipulation. Why? Because we're threatened. The institution is threatened if somebody does not modify their behavior to what we expect, right? And Jesus says, oh, no, it's, it's, much, it's a completely different, it's a completely different way. Jesus is saying external appearances bear no resemblance to their internal reality. And I want you to know today it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to say, I, I don't have it all together. Maybe you've been wearing a mask. Maybe you've been acting like everything's good in, in your life, in your world. And when you talk to certain people, you feel like you can't be honest. And when you come to Jesus, you can be completely honest. You can say it is not okay. Jesus said, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus did not show up to pour new wine into old wineskins, right? He doesn't come to just tweak the old system. He comes to say there is a, there is a brand new way. Matthew 26, <clears throat> if you turn there, we'll see what, what ends up happening as Jesus is led to, his, to the crucifixion. Matthew 26. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He tells them. He tells them what's going to happen. In verse 3, then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted together. Now what's really important, as I mentioned before, they all came together. They were at odds. They crossed party lines. That's the power of religion. Religion hurts people, and in the case of Jesus, it killed them. They came together. They plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, again, this is the power of religion. Appearance means everything. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Okay, we're going to kill him, but we can't do it today. Josephus says there were about 3 million people in the town that day. Hey, we, we don't want to cause an uproar. Because why? What was important to them? Making sure there was never an insurrection, keeping the peace of the people. Let's kill them, but let's do it under cover of darkness, by stealth, it says here. The plot to kill Jesus. Ultimately, who killed Jesus? It wasn't the tax collectors. It wasn't the, it wasn't the sinners. Right? Directly in, the, in this passage, it was the religious leaders. And there was a, a mockery of a trial. It wasn't a fair trial. And they were, all, they were all involved in leading Jesus to the cross. Romans 2, Paul writes, You, therefore, have no excuse. In Romans 1, he lists, he lists an accusation against everyone who's ever been born. And then he says in, in Romans 2, For anyone who doesn't think that's, Paul was describing them. He says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the very same things. As we read the passage in Luke, we were reminded of the prodigal son story in Luke 15. There's two sons in Luke chapter 15. As far as we know, only one of them recognizes need for a savior and received redemption. One of them was the prodigal son, the younger brother, who relates to the tax collector. He recognized that, God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. He recognizes his need to be saved. The older brother represents the religious leaders of the day. What about me? 
Why are you throwing a party for him? I've been here all along. And God, I give and I serve and all my works. And you throw a party for him? For some of us in the room today, some of us were the older brother. For some of us were the younger brother. The good news is Jesus goes to the cross. He dies for the tax collector and he dies for the Pharisee. Jesus dies for religious leaders. Jesus gave his life for, for the Thomases. He gave his life for the skeptic. He gave his life for Caiaphas. He gave his life for the tax collector. He gave his life for Barabbas. He gave his life for you and he gave his life for me. No one has clean hands this Easter as we come, we come upon the season. We recognize all that God has done on our behalf. See, some of us think when it comes to our relationship with God, we think I'm okay, but you're not okay. For some of us, maybe like the tax collector, we think I'm not okay, but everybody else looks like they're doing really well. Neither is accurate. The gospel says I'm not okay and you're not okay. And there's level playing field when we come to the cross. We're all, we're all on equal ground before the cross. For the religious leaders, they were more concerned with dress, with the words of their prayer, with their wealth, with their power, with their influence. And all Jesus is asking for is their heart. Jesus is viewed as a threat. In the movie that came out a few years ago, there's a movie called Wonder. And it's, it's about a boy with facial differences who enters the fifth grade and he wears a helmet goes through life wearing a helmet. And the dad is Owen Wilson, the mom is Julia Roberts, and, and Augie's the, the little boy. And he says this, I wish every day could be Halloween. Maybe some of us feel this way. We could all wear our masks all the time. Then we could walk around and get to know each other before we got to see what we look like under the masks. It's like, I feel much safer under my mask. Maybe, maybe we all just need to wear masks, he said. And his dad says... Augie, when you wear that helmet, the truth is, and the real, 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 real truth is, I miss seeing your face, Augie. I know you don't always love it, but you have to understand, I love it. I love it. Listen, God already knows. He knows what's in your heart. And he loves you. If we lived in first century Palestine... I'm convinced that Jesus would show up at your door, knock on your door, and want to invite himself in. And some of us would be embarrassed by what he might find in our homes. So Jesus wouldn't be embarrassed. We might be. He would be comfortable because he's with you. He loves you and he, he cares about you. He cares about your eternal destiny. A few clues or signs that religion might be showing up in our life. Let me just give you a few. How do I know if I'm leaning more on the side of religion than I am an authentic personal relationship with Jesus? We care more about appearance than reality. I care more about looking good than being authentic and sharing the real me with God and with someone else. Number two, we think God cares more about the rules and laws than he does us. I had a conversation with someone earlier today who said, I'm so sorry, I missed church last week all good. God's not keeping score if you come to church or not. Now, it's beneficial, and I would love to see you every week, but some of us have this, this list. This, we feel like God has an app on us. Every move we make, he's tracking us. He's not. Maybe this person didn't need to come to church. They needed to spend one-on-one -on -one time with God. Great. We live in a day of grace. We feel as though we're better than others, another sign. If there's any language in your vocabulary of those people, that might be a sign that you're leaning more toward religion than an authentic relationship with Jesus. We're hurting people. Religion hurts people. The tools of shame, guilt, mockery, judgment, at times even pain. Like, what do you mean? Religion killed Jesus. Jesus. His religion, ultimately, that nailed him to the cross. 
the signs that we might be leaning more toward religion. And for those here today, there's, there's two people in the room, right? There's those of us who recognize we're a sinner in need of mercy. And there's some of us, maybe you realize, oh, I'm, I'm the older brother. And for both of us, we can find mercy at the cross. We can come to the cross and find mercy. Uh, this famous artist, I don't know how many artists are in the room, but Rembrandt painted some pictures in the 1600s. He was in, from the Netherlands, and he painted a couple pictures, famous pictures. One is, this first one's called the crucifixion, uh, the cross of Jesus. And there's a whole crowd of people around the cross. And some are in the light and some are in the shadows. And you see all these hands, you see different faces. And it's believed that Rembrandt painted himself into the picture because the reality and the truth is, listen, we all put Jesus on the cross. It, it was my sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. I recognize that. I recognize I'm in, I'm in great need of a Savior. And then for anyone who questioned that, he, he paints another picture which he makes it really ultimate clear because he paints himself here at the foot of the cross with the little beret on. He's in the blue there at the cross. And he's just saying, hey, I was, I was a part of it. And over the centuries, there's been a lot of debate over who killed Jesus, right? Well, the reality is spiritually, we did. It was my sin that, that led Jesus to the cross, and it was, it was his love for me, because he wanted to deal with our sin. He can't deal with your sin if you're not willing to admit that you're in need of a Savior. And so if you are a sinner, by the way, you are, but if you recognize that you're a sinner today, Jesus can invite you into a personal, authentic relationship. From this forward on, you don't have to have an app track in you every moment of the day. You don't have to live by a list of rules, because it, if it's about being good, how good is good enough, right? It's about falling at the mercy of Jesus, saying, I'm in need. God, thank you for saving me. And you can do so today. Just simply tell Jesus, Jesus, I recognize that you came for me. You paid the price that I couldn't pay. And I say yes to you. I trust you with everything I've got. I place my faith and trust in you. And upon doing that, you are justified. You are made right with God, not because of your works, but because of what Jesus did. And now every time God looks at you and every time God looks at me, he doesn't see me and my nasty heart. He sees Jesus, who is perfect. And because of that, Jesus declares me right and perfect. It's crazy. And that can be true for you as well. You pray with me. Father, I, I thank you for the picture that we have here in the text, that you came for the tax collector and you came for the Pharisee. You came for Caiaphas, the high priest, and you came for the woman at the well. And all of us fit in there somewhere. Father, I, I pray that if there is anyone in this room today who is in need of, of saving, who has not said yes to you, that today would be the day. They place their faith and trust in you and you alone. And they would simply say seven words, Dear God, have mercy on me. Father, have your way this morning. Uh, say to us what it is we need to hear. Speak to us. In these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.